Ben Sandell, and I'm uh, one of the presenters this afternoon. And I want to thank you for coming to this webinar uh, for Startup Food Co-ops on Effective Boards and Teams Structure and Accountability. Michael Healy will also be presenting this afternoon. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to attend this and hope that you get uh, some good, interesting, informative stuff out of it. Uh, I'm, although under my name there it says CDS Consulting, actually I'm here because I was the part of, I was a part of a uh, co-op startup here in my town of Harrisonburg, Virginia from the first meeting through opening and was the board president through that uh, from incorporation on up until this past November. Um, so the perspective I'm bringing to this is as someone who has been a part of this um, uh, from the beginning. So I think any stage that you are at right now, I've, I've experienced that stage most likely. Um, so that's uh, my perspective on this. And I'm going to ask Michael Healy to introduce himself. Michael? Hey, thanks everybody for joining us today. It's Michael Healy here of CDS Consulting Co-op. And I'm joining the conference from beautiful Burlington, Vermont. Um, I have been uh, working with Ben on this presentation today and feel like I've learned a ton about uh, the process of startups and, and what works and uh, might work or might not work for other folks who are on the call. And I hope you all will learn a lot with us today also. Uh, it's been a really fun project. And I'm looking forward to uh, sharing it with you. So go ahead, Ben, and we'll get the ride started. OK. And Stuart, are you there? Well, if Stuart should show up again, we'll let him say a few words also. Um, but this is a joint project of CDS Consulting Co-op and Food Co-op Initiative, working together to bring you this series of webinars. Uh, there are two more coming. And at the end, we'll show you when those are going to be. Um, so today, uh, this is our agenda, pretty straightforward. We're going to talk uh, about accountability and empowerment. Um, we have Michael and I have worked on a uh, document, a series of documents, of which we've got the first piece of it uh, ready. So we're going to introduce you to that some. Uh, we're going to talk about accountability and communication, as it shows there. We will have time for Q&A, and depending on the flow as we go, if there are more questions, we may open it up during at other times also. Um, and that's where we are with that. So this is a topic that is, uh, I guess I'd say, dear to my heart. Because in, the, in my experience with uh, Friendly City Food Co-op here in Harrisonburg, it's something that we struggled with quite a bit um, with both of these accountability and uh, structure. And we found that when we were doing it well, things went so much better and flowed better. Uh, we got more work done, and we had more fun with it. Um, and when we struggled with it, well, you know, struggle is hard. Uh, so we will talk more about uh, empowerment in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that's important, I think, to keep in mind is whether you put effort into figuring out your structure uh, or not, you're going to have a structure. So you might as well make it an intentional process rather than just take what happens. Um, it's something that all co-ops have to wrestle with uh, to, you know, to some degree. But with startups, I think it's even more important. Because uh, generally, if you're a, a startup group, you don't have previous steering committee or board experience. You're learning on the job. Uh, you very likely have your own full-time job or your own job and your own family commitments and life. Uh, there's a lot to learn, a lot to do. Uh, and you will have a lot of people who are behind you, the people who are empowering you to do your work. Uh, so there is a lot to, uh, there's a lot to think about there and a lot to keep in mind. And good structure is going to help you with that. I will make a note on language at this time that I'm going to refer to steering committees and task groups. Um, that is, you, you may have different terms that your group is using. Steering committee, founding team, 
Uh, once you're incorporated, most likely you'll be referring to yourself as the board. Um, and then, of course, task groups can also be subcommittees. Uh, but this is the language that we're using in our document, Michael and I. So it's the, the that's what you're going to hear me use throughout this. Um, so I'd like to bring this in. I'm not going to go into great detail with this. Hopefully you were on the earlier webinar where Bill Gessner did go into uh, a fair amount of detail about this. Um, but I do think it's really important to stress this. I consider the four cornerstones and three stages model to be a foundational resource. And by that, I mean it's, it's something you will uh, keep coming back to throughout your startup process. Uh, along with some of your other resources like uh, bylaws, articles of incorporation, um, the policy templates that we're going to talk about. Um, these are things that help keep you focused, help keep you on track, and, and in moments of stress can also help uh, bring you back to, okay, what are we really trying to do here? What are our needs? How are we going to get through these moments of stress or these challenges that will inevitably come up? Um, and, uh, well, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but I will mention that the vision, talent, capital, and systems, keeping those uh, cornerstones in mind throughout your process can really uh, help inform your structure because every, pretty much every step of the way you're, you're asking yourself, do we have these in place or what do we need to do to get these in place so that we can uh, be successful at this stage of our process. So who are we accountable to? That's, that's a good question. And even if you don't have a lot of members at this point, uh, you want to imagine that you do. You want to pretend that they're already there. Uh, that will help you inform your decision making. Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a valuable exercise to do. Um, even if you already have a couple hundred members, which depending on what stage you are in your process could be a really great start, um, you will have a lot more at some point. So it's always nice to imagine uh, that you've got a whole lot more people sitting out there looking at what you're doing um, there. Uh, so, and the people out there, the people that you're imagining are there that will be members at some point, hopefully, you know, they really, uh, as you spread the word, as you tell the story of your co-op, they want to help. They want to plug in somehow, um, but they need you to show them how to do that. And really, you have to ask, too. Um, it's a very important skill to uh, practice and learn is, you know, ask for what you need, ask for the help that you want to get from your community. Um, there is a lot to do in starting a, a food co-op. Uh, it can be hard, it can be confusing and frustrating. Um, this is why communication can be so, or uh, is so important, uh, and this is why we're doing this series of webinars and creating the materials uh, for this, is because it is hard. And you're out there doing this while you're doing all the other things in your life. Probably pretty unlikely you've ever done this before or even something quite like it. Um, it's, it's perfectly understandable to be asking, OK, uh, what help can we get for this? How are we going to do this? What does this process look like? How should we structure ourselves to be able to get our work done most effectively? Um, Michael, would you like to add a little at this point? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, as, I've, as I've been talking with Ben about this and, and trying to learn from your experience, Ben, there at Friendly City, and, uh, and talking to other folks in startups, I realize we, we've got this great concept of the four cornerstones in three stages. Uh, and uh, in earlier webinars, hopefully some of you all who are listening today have checked some of those out. There's been some conversation about the importance of creating alignment. And what I am starting to understand is that one way we create alignment is through conversation. Um, and another part of it is by the conscious choices of structure uh, and an accountability system. And that's what we're going to talk about in this webinar today, is to present some ideas of how you can create a structure and accountability system that, that actually are useful in building alignment. Um, so one of the things that 
you might try is to go back to some of those earlier webinars and look at them and uh, think about that concept of alignment again in this new light, in this, in this uh, light of um, thinking about structures that we pick uh, because, because they help us uh, align ourselves with each other and uh, an accountability system that we pick for the same reason, because it keeps us aligned. So anyway, that's the, that's the framing that I'm starting to, to understand for myself. I have found it helpful, and maybe it'll work for you also. Um, so thanks, Ben. Um, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so yes, you know, you're accountable to your members, your community, and to the other people, all of you who are working together on this, on this project. Um, so there's some, some pretty basic ideas about accountability. Um, that, that you're seeing some of here. Some of this is going to happen at every meeting. Um, you may do uh, uh, you may do progress reports or you may do check-ins where you find out how are people doing uh, in relation to what tasks they've already been assigned. Um, some of these uh, may be done at annual retreats, may be done in regular calls with consultants or other experts. Um, and of course, when we, uh, when you have the policy template in your hand uh, and other resources that are available now and that will be available in the future, they will also help you with uh, the these pieces of the puzzle. Um, some more accountability basics. Uh, this is where I like to bring the the four cornerstones and three stages back into it. Um, they can be a good test of reasonableness something that came up for us regularly through our uh, process at Friendly City was, you know, we go to CCMA, the uh, kind of annual cooperative get-together, or uh, bring back some great idea from somewhere, bring it to our steering committee meeting, and everybody would get really excited, oh, that's great, we've got to do that. And then we'd think about, okay, well, do we have you know, we have we appear to have a vision for it. Do we have the people for it? Do we have the systems for it? Do we have the capital for it? And that can be a good sobering uh, thought, and it brings you back to accountability. You know, do we want to spend our resources, our very limited time, energy, money, and systems? Do we want to put that into that idea, or is our community, our members, uh, and each other, are we looking to do something different, or maybe something more? Uh, truer to our, our vision for the organization. And it may be that some of those great ideas you do decide to, to uh, incorporate into your process. That's great. Um, that's part of the, the process, too. Um, I also want to stress at this point um, that bottom bullet point, uh, don't be afraid to communicate bad news, too. Uh, communication is really important. I think there can be. Certainly, we had a tendency at Friendly City that when things weren't going so well, we didn't necessarily want to talk about it as much. We were concerned that it was going to give us a bad reputation or uh, that people would begin to get skittish if we were communicating challenges or bad news. Um, we had a period where we didn't really say anything for a while, and we started getting seeing some blog posts from people who were following us closely that were very critical. Uh, and basically saying, where'd they go? They took our money and we haven't heard from them in a while. And we realized that it was much more uh, helpful, much more constructive for us to be upfront and open about the challenges we had. Hey, you know, we, got, we thought we had uh, this step in place and it fell through and we, got, we were momentarily thrown off our game and we're regrouping and coming back and we're going to do fine, but, uh, you know, Communicate those things. Um, it's important for people to know that you're working, that things are happening, and maybe someone will come forward with a great solution also. So these are some very simple uh, diagrams to illustrate empowerment and accountability. On the left-hand side, you've you know got your uh, accountability structure, or I'm sorry, your empowerment structure, where uh, your members are uh, at the top, and you might even include a larger oval, which would be the whole community, or your member farm team. Uh, and they're empowering your steering committee, that most likely all of you out there, uh, to do the work 
that has to be done, or at least to make sure the work gets done. I think that's uh, an important distinction. Um, and then you, in turn, are empowering the task groups or your subcommittees. And that's where a lot of this work actually gets done, down in those committees. And it's uh, kind of the reverse of that for um, accountability. The task groups are accountable to your steering committee. So they're going to be reporting back. They're going to be uh, uh, using the budgets that have been laid out. Um, they're going to be reporting back to the steering committee. And then the steering committee is going to be uh, accountable to the community, to your members, and to each other. So Michael, do you want to talk a little about how we make sure accountability happens? Uh, sure. Um, but I, I want to back up just a second sure. to remind us that um, what Ben and I are going to be talking about here today are, I don't, I don't mean to that slide, but just oh, okay. the, the whole concept, thank you, um, that, that uh, we're going to be talking about structures, we're going to be talking about accountability, um, but that's not really the point of why we're doing food co-ops. We, we seldom are we, are we starting this um, amazing adventure because we think, oh, let's, we want to do it so we'll have structure and accountability. Um, that a big part of what we're doing is really building human relationship, uh, and and the structure and accountability is not a substitute for that. We aren't we aren't at all trying to say that that other piece that that relationship piece isn't more important. But good relationships are always happening within some context or another. It's a family, or it's a co-op, or it's a a ball team, or it's uh, a workspace, whatever it is. And we want to make sure that whatever the context is, within that context, we have a structure that makes sense. And so in the world of food co-ops, we have these owners, these member owners, who have empowered a board or in, in a startup, um, a, a, again, as Ben said earlier, imagining that those members are there and they have empowered uh, you as a, as a steering committee um, to get, some, get something done. And uh, then that steering committee is going to have to delegate to someone else to do something beyond what that small group of volunteers can do. So a lot of the structure we're talking about is how do we, how do we delegate clearly to each other, um, but then remembering that we're in the context of, of, uh, of what we hope will be a robust democracy. We also want good accountability that, that the folks who have delegated that power or, or, or authority um, should know that the folks who are using the authority on their behalf are using it well. And it's a common conversation in our society about um, accountability. Here, we're not going to talk about accountability as it's often used um, as uh, wagging our finger after the fact. Someone did something bad and we're going to hold them accountable. We're really talking about accountability as just something that's a, a natural and necessary part of democratic control. It's just going to be built into our system. And that's really the ideal that we're trying to achieve here and uh, what we're trying to offer in, in the suggestions today. So hopefully you all can hear it that way as um, it's a structure within a context. It's not more important than the human relationships, but it's a structure that helps us accomplish what we want, which is to get a food co-op that can open up and serve our community and to do that in a democratic context. So thanks, Ben. Yeah, no, well, thank you. That's, that's really a super point. And I realize I can get a bit hung up on uh, process. And uh, you know, I was the board president. I was the guy who held the agenda for uh, the whole time here. But it really is about how we create the organization and projecting that out a little further to the community and the society that we want to be a part of. So this is, uh, I think, very much about when you, as people who are you know, going to be known in your community as the people working on this food co-op. As you're walking down the street and people stop you and say, "Hey, what's what's going on now?" and you know, "When's it going to open?" and all the uh, questions that that we all get, that you also are able to have an informed answer that you know what the the different structures are behind you. It it certainly carries a lot more weight and helps the conversation go really well when you can say, well, you know, we're following this process. Here's where we are at this process. We've got some challenges at the moment. We meet monthly. And by the way, feel free to come to our meeting. Um, and here's different ways you can get more information. Uh, so it's not just about 
structure and accountability. It's really about how you make this great thing happen and how you improve your world in the process. So I don't put this up here for you to read because obviously it's, at least on my computer, it's basically illegible. Um, but it's a little screen capture of the document that uh, Michael and I have created, the first, uh, uh, the first stage of it that corresponds with the organizing stage in the three stages, four cornerstones model. What we tried to do, um, if you've looked on the CDS website, you've seen the you may have seen um, the policy template that's there for operational co-ops. It's a great tool uh, for co-ops that have uh, that have staff that are facing the challenges that operational co-ops face. But in looking at how, in looking at the needs that startups have um, to get good governance in place, to have a good process in place. Um, to have a structure and accountability in place, we felt that it wasn't as relevant as it really needed to be, nor as accessible, because it had so much language in it that related specifically to operational co-ops. So we took that, we simplified it, we stripped out a lot of language, um, and made what we feel is much more accessible and relevant for startup groups. Uh, it is going to track and eat through all the stages. Um, the first stage is up now, and we'll have the link at the end of this that shows you where you can find it. It's on the, in the CDS library. Um, and then as you go through the stages and get closer to being an operational co-op and make the transition that you're going to make, uh, this template will track with that and will lead you pretty nicely into uh, the, um, the policy template uh, that is currently in place for operational co-ops. Of course, this is completely adaptable for your uses. The, the, that's the whole idea here is, uh, and one of the beauties of cooperative development is every co-op is unique and different. You're going to adapt this for your own uses, but it can be really handy to have something to adapt to your own uses. Um, so one of the key pieces we tried to build into this template is uh, giving the steering committee, uh, eventually the board, um, a really straightforward job description, um, which is our job is to create the organization that can investigate, open, and own a food co-op. Uh, and that's, I'm, in general, I'm going to try not to read it all from this document, but I felt that that one statement is really important because you may notice that it doesn't say anything about, we're going to do all the work needed to start a food co-op. Uh, no, you're going to uh, investigate, you're going to create the organization, you're going to do what needs to be done to create the system that will then open and run uh, a food co-op, open and own, excuse me, uh, because your staff will do the running of it. Um, so we've, uh, um, so uh, there are going to be times, certainly, especially in the earlier stages, when you may have fewer people involved in all the work that has to get done, where it's going to be some of the same people who are going to be on the steering committee as are going to be on the task groups. Uh, and that's a, a concept that served us well at Friendly City, and I think a lot of co-ops kind of embrace, is this idea of wearing different hats, that when you are in your steering committee meetings and you're making these uh, decisions about direction, you're doing um, you're looking at the work that has been done in the task groups to make your decisions. You're wearing one type of hat. You're wearing your steering committee hat. Uh, when you then are out of that venue and you're at a uh, task group meeting or you're doing some of the research, some of the work that has to be done, the footwork, um, you're at member events, you're generating membership, you're talking about loans, you're wearing a totally different hat. And it's important to keep that in mind. There are different ways you may speak in those different venues, um, different perspectives that you're going to hold. Uh, and as your organization grows, as you have more people involved, that's probably going to become clearer because the roles will become a little more uh, distinct. Um, and uh, note on budgets, once you have a pro forma in place, I expect many of you may already have that. You know, that's going to very much inform your budgeting. But even before you have that in place, it's still, 
creating these budgets is a great thing to do. It keeps you, uh, well, it, it, it's essential, basically, to make sure that you're spending your money wisely, and that's another piece of accountability. Things can get tense at times um, when you are, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, there is a lot of information that you have to process. You have to gather and process to do what you have to do. Um, one of the ways that, uh, one of the things that we have built into this template is that the task groups are going to create ranges of options. So the, a lot of the basic research is going to be done at the task group level. They're going to look at um, different options and then bring those options to the steering committee to make the final decision about uh, which, w where to go on a, a given issue. And it may be a range of options for accounting firms uh, to help with that side of it or consultants. Um, it may uh, be a range of options of real estate uh, people or firms. Uh, to help you with your location search. Okay, here's where I want to talk about how things can get tense at times. Um, and that's a natural thing. In next week's webinar, you're going to hear uh, Michael and Art talk a bit about this uh, forming, storming, norming model, which I'm not going to get into too much here. But the, the, the one of the basic ideas about that is as a group, just coming together to start doing this work, you're uh, probably, a, you know, you may not even all know each other when you first start working together. You may have different visions for what this food co-op should be. So you come together and you all want to see a food co-op in your community, but inevitably there's going to be some differences. There's going to be some, you know, uh, conflict, or potential conflict or uh, differences of opinion over what's it going to look like, where should it be located, how big it is, etc. Um, that's where having really excellent communication is going to be very helpful, uh, where you can um, you uh, can hash things out respectfully but uh, robustly in your steering committee meetings. Come out with decisions and with people understanding that. Uh, when you then turn around and talk to the public, to the community, to your members, you are speaking with one voice and you're respecting the decisions that have been made within that. Uh, and that's where our template provides the guidelines for that type of communication. Um, Michael, do you want to talk a little about uh, that? Uh, yeah, thanks. A, a couple things. Um, I was uh, Several months back I was speaking with um, Allison, who I think might even be listening in today uh, at the South Philly Food Co-op, and uh, she was saying that they were trying, kind of trying on for size different structures, trying to figure out how to help themselves, organize themselves to, to get their work done. And uh, I was really listening to that and, and recognizing that for a startup group, we do need a structure, but we need one that fits uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish. And then hearing Ben's stories at Friendly, from Friendly City, um, there are some commonalities uh, for startup food court groups that there's a, there's a level of structure that works for us. Whether you choose to use what Ben and I are suggesting in this policy template is going to be totally up to you. What we want to really emphasize is, is we hope that you will recognize that you do have a structure, whether you choose it consciously or not. And uh, this is what Ben uh, reminded us of at the very beginning, I wanted to reemphasize it, that you can consciously choose your structure uh, and choose one that will help you accomplish your goal. And so you don't have to choose one that's a structure that's really intended to help a, a different group accomplish their goal, but one that really works for you. And so our hope is that the policy template that we're going to um, put out there for you is, uh, is a, a design that you could use uh, to think about your own structure, something that will help you create the organization that can investigate and open and own a food co-op, um, because that really is what startup groups are, are all about. So thanks, Ben. You're welcome. Thank you. So it, it, yes, one of the challenges that Michael and I have had uh, in working on this template, but also in working on this webinar, is we, re, we understand that there are groups out there 
uh, at a lot of different stages and making progress at different speeds. Um, it's hard to create something that's maybe, uh, I mean, we have to create what we can create and hope that all of you will take everything you can from it. Um, so it is never too early to try to uh, establish an effective structure to make sure that your communication uh, is also effective, um, is respectful, and is uh, robust both internally and externally. Um, it, although, in a way, it's also never too late. It can be actually too late, because if you spend too much time or get uh, too far into the process without establishing good structure, and as Michael says, you're going to have structure whether you work on it consciously or not, um, you're going to, if you go too far, you will have a hard time getting enough people involved. You may lose community support. Uh, you may find that credibility is going to be lacking or uh, hard to generate in your community. Um, so starting good habits early is going to really serve you well all along the line. Um, so here is how uh, these agreements will change. Uh, one of the ways that agreements are going to ch uh, uh, change as your process goes on, this is a pretty basic one, where as you move from stage one to stage two and you begin to look at having a project manager, general manager coming in, where is that person going to slot into both the empowerment and accountability chain? Um, and this uh, illustrates that. And again, I'm going to ask Michael to talk a little more about that. This is an area that he's very well versed in. Well, one of the things I, I really appreciate about the diagram you put together here, Ben, is that it's a, it, it's a very clear view of structure works, and a structure works best if it can adapt as your project develops. And so if we have a, a clear understanding among ourselves about uh, a, a chain of empowerment, who, who has delegated what to whom, then we could imagine that, oh, we've delegated the steering committee uh, a bunch of stuff to some task groups, and at some point, it's ho hopefully, we will be hiring a professional manager and then we could imagine ourselves saying, oh, then that would be the person we would delegate some of that stuff to. That's what, and, and so you see in this diagram, the, the project manager or the general manager would fit in that chain. And then that person might then have other committees that work for that person to, to help do whatever it is it needs doing, um, but that the steering committee would no longer be in charge of those task groups or committees. And it's very easy to imagine this, uh, schematically, and then also to recognize that that's exactly what we are setting ourselves up for when we're starting a food co-op, that we're going to have a situation uh, at the very beginning of our growth and development that will by necessity change, and that's what we wanted to do. We, want, we don't want to stay with the same structure um, from day one that we will have five years down the line or ten years down the line. Um, we really want to have a structure that makes sense for a fully operational food cooperative. So what we're trying to do is present a system that is adaptable as you move along. And so you will find that within each stage of the, the template, there are certain things that you will be able to adapt even as you're in that one stage. And then you will find that you can adapt, uh, jump to the next version of the template, essentially, um, when you are ready to move into a, a more formalized structure or one that has more um, pieces in, uh, involved, as in the general manager or project manager. Um, what we would like to also um, think about as we're moving forward is that not only will you uh, have task groups that will change as your project develops, not only will you eventually have a, um, a board instead of a steering committee, and not only will you have a project manager or general manager, a professional who you've hired to do the work, eventually the, the organizing group or the, the governing group or whatever you might think of it initially will have a completely different function um, that you will be moving into an organization that is governed by a board um, as opposed to an organization that is being um, spearheaded by a steering committee. And we are presenting um, some structural foundations that you could imagine moving through that whole progression 
um, by building piece on piece of the of the, the policy template, essentially the working agreements, and add to them as you go along. Because that's the point of it all, that we want to get to that, that new form of being eventually. Um, I also just want to mention real quick that uh, in next week's um, presentation with Ben and Art Sherwood, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the changes that, that will be happening. So we'll get more into that topic, um, thinking about how, how you will um, imagine the progression of growth from, from that very earliest stages of development until much later. Um, so hopefully you'll come back and join us for that one. So thanks, Ben. You're welcome. Thank you. And yes, please do tune in again next week, but we're not done yet. So accountability is, of course, more than just communication, but communication is such a key piece of accountability. Um, and it's really important not to take the what you might call the easy or the obvious things for granted. Um, I mean, minutes of meetings can be a great way both for people who want to dig a little deeper, who want to see how your process is going, how your structure looks, um, how your progress is going, for them to, to do that. And it's a great way for people to uh, plug in and catch up. So especially as you look at how you want to recruit new steering committee members and new volunteers, those are uh, very easy and effective ways um, to get people to plug in. And again, I want to mention that accountability is not sugarcoating. You want to be very honest and clear about the challenges that you uh, have. Um, two of the big challenges that we encountered with Friendly City were, of course, financing, which I think is a big challenge for all co-ops. But we also thought that we had our location nailed down. It's a, it was a location that had been approved by our market study and we had come to an agreement on cost and everything looked great and then the landlord said no I won't so I won't uh, separate the space to the size that we had originally talked about you take all of it or else you don't take any of it um, so we had to find a co-tenant and we had to find that co-tenant quickly uh, so that was a, a case where we batted it around in our uh, at that point our board meeting as to what do we do? How are we going to solve this? And we went out to the community and our members and said, you know, here's our situation. Very clearly, very honestly, here's the help that we really need. We need someone to take that other 4,000 square feet. Here's how much it costs. Here's the terms. And that was incredibly helpful. People came forward and said, oh, you know, I know of an organization that's looking for space. Uh, maybe I will take that space. And ultimately, we were able to get a good co-tenant who has a slightly shorter lease than we do. So uh, asking and communicating can be so, so helpful in that way. Um, talking to community leaders, to consultants, uh, to um, everyone you can, and helping that inform your, uh, your decision making, but also be a little discriminating about that, uh, that feedback. Um, you're going to get some negative feedback also, and that's not a bad thing, but you really want to ask yourself, OK, um, where is this coming from? Is there a context? Is there a pattern? So that you're not blowing uh, from one direction to another direction as you get negative feedback. Again, that's where having these great working agreements or, or having effective working agreements in place can be really great for an organization. It keeps you on course. You have that as part of your foundational resources to say, OK, I just got some bad news from somewhere, or somebody gave me some really negative feedback. Um, how does this fit into our overall plan, or does it even matter at this point? Um, I had, after speaking to a Rotary Club, I had a gentleman come up to me who identified himself as the former manager of the local independent grocery store, and who told me, pretty much point blank, that this co-op idea was never going to work. We were never going to get the store open. And we didn't understand why we were working on it. And that, as you can imagine, that was some uh, pretty shocking feedback to get. But I took it back to our uh, steering committee. We talked about it some. Um, you know, we realized that uh, this is a big change in the community. Maybe he felt it was threatening to his old organization. And his knowledge was 25 years old. Uh, so we were able to, rather than get thrown off course, we took that in to realize, all right, we also maybe have to think about what our message is, how we're communicating uh, our message to our community, 
um, it was a good learning experience. Ultimately, we didn't end up changing anything about our process. Uh, it just made us even more aware of our uh, communication. Um, and again, Michael, I'd like to, to bring you back in here because I think you have some great things on this, too. Um, thanks. Uh, just for a second, I want to remind folks that we're going to try to answer questions. And if you've had questions along the way about either the policy working agreements template that we're going to present or about any part of the story that Ben has been telling um, about his experience at Friendly City or any other part of our presentation, um, now's a good time to start thinking of what those are and start uh, sending them in to, through your uh, chat um, box there. Um, and then on this topic here, I want to say that um, in Ben's stories, it's it's easy to uh, forget that um, that accountability is a particular kind of communication. So there's all kinds of communication, and the more we have, um, as Ben has described, the, the more success we're likely to have. No guarantees, of course, we know this, but accountability is a particular kind of communication. It's a, it's a communication about specific things. It's about whether we're upholding agreements. Um, it, it, it's about uh, we as steering committee members have uh, agreed to do certain things for each other or with each other. And when we communicate back to each other about those agreements, that's accountability. When a task group has been delegated uh, a responsibility to, do, to go get a, something done or to go find some information, when that group communicates back to the steering committee about what they have done, whether they've accomplished what they were supposed to or not, or what they've learned in the process, that's accountability. So accountability really um, is not the first place you start. Accountability is a response to a specific delegation or a specific empowerment. So there's all kinds of communication that's going to be happening. But remember that there's this really critical piece that we're trying to emphasize here today. And it's the piece of responding back to the person or the group that has delegated authority to us, whether that's the membership, whether it's the community, whether it's the steering committee. Um, but really, it's, it's a specific response to a specific delegation. So thanks, great. Ben. Yeah, great. That's excellent. Um, and hold on one second here. Well, I, there we go. Um, so yes, exactly. It, it is a specific uh, type. Uh, you know, I feel my experience at Friendly City was very lucky. We were very lucky that we generally had a group that communicated well, um, that was able to see past some of our personal uh, things to, to come together as a good group. You can't take that uh, for granted. There are no guarantees that that's going to be the case. And you're going to inevitably have people coming in and out of your group, too. So what, what, what could have been a really functional group can change. Um, and that's where adopting guidelines for this kind of communication uh, for accountability can really uh, help enormously. Um, we are also uh, hope to be working on some sample of monitoring reports. And I'd love to see some additional tools created there that I'm going to try to work on. Um, and uh, as you take away from this and go back to your groups, one thing, another thing uh, I'd like you to think about is the incidents, how often you're going to be doing this checking back, doing this uh, kind of closing the loop again. Of uh, You want to, of course, be checking with each other uh, every meeting. You know, at every steering committee or board meeting, I think it's very helpful to do a check-in especially if there are people who haven't said anything or said very little in that meeting to try to bring them back in and, and find out what they're thinking. Um, but you're also uh, going to be looking at some more formal evaluations and reviews that may occur quarterly or uh, annually. Um, and that's something, too, that as you work with consultants, if you get involved with the Seabuild program, that a, an annual retreat can be very, very helpful with those kind of uh, process and progress evaluation. Um, so at this point, I would like to see if there are questions for uh, me and Michael. Joel, what do we have out there? Uh, we do have a question uh, from Carissa. And Carissa 
would love to hear anyone's experience with board meetings that are open to staff or members as non-voting attendees. Does this shift or inhibit your board's ability to run effective, honest meetings? I think probably both Michael and I can talk some about that. Um, we certainly always tried to encourage people uh, to come to our meetings. And once we began to have staff, we would have our um, our general manager and our outreach coordinator came to pretty much all our meetings and we encouraged other staff members to come too. It can affect things, but we chose at the beginning of every meeting um, to explain what our process was. Of course, we always had an agenda and we followed the agenda. Um, and we were pretty strict about not necessarily adding things unless there was a clear reason to add it to the agenda. Um, and that explaining a little bit about what our process and our communication uh, was. Um, we also made use of closed session when it was legally necessary. So if we were talking about a personnel issue related to the general manager um, or something else that we felt was sensitive, um, for instance, prior to signing the lease, we considered that a sensitive uh, um, the discussion of certain terms and, and finances of the lease, we would go into closed session. And again, that would be on the agenda ahead of time, and we would explain it to people. Um, but we did not find that it inhibited our ability to have robust discussion. Um, we certainly welcomed people to come and ask questions, uh, but we also had specific times associated with all of our agenda items. So people were able to see that we had a certain amount of time to cover each piece. If they had a question, that was great. but we really hope that they would keep it concise. Um, Michael, do you want to talk some about this too? Oh, yeah, it's one of my favorite topics ever. It's a great question. Thanks, Chris. Uh, um, I, I, I feel like it, it really gets to the crux of what do we want and expect from a democratically controlled cooperative. And in, uh, there was an article I wrote a few years ago. You, all, you might want to check it out uh, in Cooperative Grocer uh, about uh, this topic in a broad way. And as I wrote that article and talked to folks, I was really thinking about what, what do we mean? What does it mean to have democracy? And I think it's important to know that if we're going to be accountable to our member owners, if we really are a community-owned business, then those people have uh, a right to witness us at our governing work. Um, so having people present, uh, I don't, I don't I don't think it makes sense to go out of our way to try to invite people to meetings because they always have, uh, you know, people have other things to do with their lives besides sit through a board meeting. Um, but if they want to be there, they they should certainly be welcome. Um, but that's different than participating. And so where Ben was describing their experience of Friendly City of having uh, folks able to ask questions, generally I feel like they're they're in in a democratic uh, controlled organization in a meeting of the board or of the steering committee. There is some space in the meeting for anyone who's present to speak to that that group, um, but otherwise the, the meeting is for that group of people to do the work they're there to do, and so folks can stay and witness and, and listen in, um, but the meeting is really for the steering committee or for the board, um, and so there are rare occasions where the meeting would need to be closed, as, as Ben mentioned, um, but I think having people present as witness is uh, it's part of open meetings in a democratic society, and so we should, uh, although sometimes it is uncomfortable, um, it shouldn't be scary for us. We should just be able to, to do that. So it's, a, it's a, always a conundrum in every, you know, in, in every city and town and state around the, the, the country. You hear conversations about open meetings and who is or isn't included. So we, we in the world of co-ops get to struggle with that, too. So thanks. Good question. Oh, uh, there is a comment from uh, Patrick at Arroyo Food Co-op in Altadena, California, who just writes in to say that uh, they were starting, uh, as they were just starting, one of the community leaders told them that they would be uh, that he had tried to organize a co-op previously and had failed to get more than three members. We have his advice and kept pushing on. We just cleared 400 members last weekend. Ooh. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and there, 
I think there will always be elements, uh, you know, you have some folks who are um, really early adopters of a new idea or of an interesting idea, real positive folks, and you have some that are in the middle, and you have some that may never embrace something. And sometimes you encounter those never folks early in the process, and it can be a little off-putting, but, you know, if you have a good plan, if you have a vision, if you have a great way to talk about it and keep the work moving forward, you can keep yourself from getting uh, delayed or put off by some of the negative energy from some of those kind of comments. So that's great to hear that you got to 400. Go for 600 now. <laughs> um, let me offer one other perspective on that, too, which uh, just to tie that comment to our uh, policy template for startups that we're um, posting. You'll notice in the, the assignments that we've uh, the, the sort of suggestions for how we assign things to the task groups. Primarily, we're saying the task group's job is to bring a range of options back to the steering committee. And so with any question, there, there are going to be a range of possibilities. It could be possible that the group could only get three people signing up, um, but it could also be possible that a 1,000 would sign up. And so we'd want to have a basic sense of what are the range of possibilities and what are the implications of each of those and then let's make a decision based on our own best judgment about what we're going to pursue. Um, so we're, as a steering committee you're going to get advice from a, a, a whole wide spectrum of folks who um, either rightfully uh, know what is best practice or have some good guesses about the future or have their own agendas or personal opinions um, and getting that information is critical, and then knowing that someone has entrusted you with the, with the the um, authority, with the power to then make a decision to choose. And uh, if it were all guaranteed, if we knew in advance who was going to win the Super Bowl, why well, gosh, we just never watch the game. But that part of the excitement of it is someone actually gets to go out there and play the game, and that's what the steering committee gets to do. You get to go out there and make some decisions based on a range of possibilities. So I think that's a, a, a great story um, to remind us that we don't want to just stick with one answer to a question. We want to hear what, what, what the range of possible answers are and then make some decisions based on that. Yeah, thanks for that comment. Yeah. Uh, we have a quick follow-up to uh, the earlier question from Carissa here. Lynn Walter asks, do you post your board minutes on the co-op website? We don't. We make them available to anyone who wants to ask for them, uh, but we chose not to post them on the website. Um, one way to think about that, um, about posting minutes, as been to, minutes should be open, I think, to, to the owners of the organization. But posting minutes is kind of a, a weak attempt at transparency. It's not or accountability. Um, just just giving someone the minutes doesn't really um, inform them about what you're doing on their behalf. And so, in my mind, the question whether to post minutes or not is kind of like a red herring. That the real question is, how do we inform our members and our community about what we're doing on their behalf? How we're using the resources that they've entrusted to us. Um, and so that takes more than just posting minutes. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a different conversation altogether. So um, at the, earlier in the session, Ben gave some ideas about communication. How do we communicate back out to our community about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're making the choices we're making. Um, and and minutes, minutes are really, their intention is to be a, a legal record of your proceedings, of, of the decisions you've made. But they're not really intended to be an accountability mechanism. Uh, or a communication mechanism to your members. But I think there's probably other tools that are better for that. Yeah, they, they are a tool, especially for people who may be interested in taking part in the board, um, in serving or being on a committee. It can help them a little bit get up to speed, but I think primarily they show people that, yes, we're meeting regularly, we're documenting our meetings, we're following the process, and in some cases we're you know, fulfilling our legal obligation. Um, uh, really, it's much more effective, we found, going face-to-face -face with people and meeting them where they are, going to their Rotary meetings and their Ruritan meetings. Um, we would have uh, get-togethers uh, in churches and in bars 
Um, we threw parties, we had dinners, anywhere where we could get in front of people and have a real face-to-face -face conversation where they, they could ask their questions and we could uh, talk about our process and, and how we were doing and what more we needed from our community and from our membership. Um, and I, I guess I'd also like to put out there, you know, as our our co-op opened June 6th of 2011, so we've got whatever that is now, seven, eight months under our belts, and it's going very well. Um, it, it is a challenging process. Uh, there can be tension. There can be stress. There's a lot of work to do, but it's a great process, and especially um, it, uh, I guess I, if I can possibly communicate how awesome it is to walk down the halls of the, walk down the aisles of the store that you helped create and that you really helped bring into existence in your community, it's a great feeling. So I'm so excited that you are all working on this out there, um, that there are so many commu uh, communities that are getting co-ops in development. Uh, go for it. It's awesome. Yes, thank you are, there more, are there more questions? Uh, there are no more questions at the moment, but now is okay. probably a good time to start wrapping up. Yeah, and so this is resources, and uh, as Joel mentioned, he's going to be sending out a copy of these slides, so you will have all these links. Um, this, uh, these are ways that you can contact uh, me and also Michael, um, and also get other help and view this webinar. Um, these are some of the upcoming webinars. Next week is uh, teamwork process and decision making, and that should be a fun one. Um, Art's in that one. He's always a fun guy. Uh, and then the starting a new buying club was rescheduled, so that is coming up on the 21st with Stuart and Jake. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you for coming and spending this time with us, and thank you so much for doing the work of getting co-op started in your community. Um, yeah, and let me echo that. I really appreciate that you've taken the time to to listen in on on this presentation. Hopefully, you found something useful for you here. Um, I do hope that if you try using any of the tools and ideas that Ben and I are presenting, that you'll let us know how something works for you, um, and if you have ideas for how we can improve it uh, to make it even more useful for startups around the country, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and I'm not sure if Stuart, if you're um, uh, able to uh, speak up now, but I would love to have you take a second if you want to close us out today. Well, am I there or not? Yes, yeah. you're here. I'll be darned. I don't know what happened the first time around. I apologize, but thank you for a great presentation. Um, Food Co-op Initiative has been really pleased to be able to partner with EDS Consulting Co-op people to put on these webinars for you. and. Um, encourage you to check out our website, their website, and sign up for the mailing list, and we'll keep you posted on all the other good things that are coming our way. Thanks again, guys. Thank you, Stuart. And I, I think that that pretty much wraps things up. So thanks very much, and have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>